Let's go to our agenda. Hydronics for net zero houses. Uh, this is a two-part presentation. So this morning we're going to kind of give you some background information. What's happening with energy markets? What's happening with building markets? And how those, those uh, circumstances are coming together. I think it presents a fantastic opportunity for the North American hydronics industry even beyond anything that, that I've experienced in over 40 years in working in this industry. And I'll try to justify that statement as we go through today. So this morning, we're going to look at electrification. It is happening quickly in both Canada as well as in the U.S. So a lot of parallel regulations, legislations, and so forth taking place. Um, and then you'll see the next topic that I've got down, poor perceptions of hydronic systems. What, what is a hydronic system to the average consumer? You know, do they see 35 circulators lined up on a wall and just hundreds of thousands of dollars equipment and conclude that this is for the rich and famous? Or can we tailor our systems that are for the average Joe, so to speak, consumer? And also in the process, how do we have to redo our thinking for um, matching these systems up with these net zero building markets? Uh, so we'll look at what's changing in residential construction. I'm sure many of you are dealing with it every day, but we'll kind of summarize that. We're going to talk about the difference between true comfort and thermodynamics. Uh, justify why should consumers look at hydronics? They have a lot of choices today. They have mini splits. They obviously have forced air. What does hydronics bring to the table? And especially in light of where energy markets are now, and consumer attitudes towards energy markets. And then we're going we're to talk briefly about a relatively new energy source in hydronic systems, air to water heat pumps. Okay? And then if you'll come back at 4 o'clock, we're going to do a little deeper dive into some of the technology, uh, the importance of low water temperature distribution systems. I think probably everybody in the room that's been doing hydronic systems has watched the trend over the years moving towards heat sources that operate better at low water temperatures. Obviously, condensing boilers operate better at low water temperatures, and so do heat pumps, both water-to-water -water heat pumps that would be used in geothermal systems as well as the air-to-water heat pumps that we'll be talking about. So uh, we're, we're going to kind of do a review of what's available out there in terms of heat emitters in low water temperature systems. Uh, obviously, floor heating uh, can be done with low water temperatures, but there is other options out there as well. Uh, retrofitting, I think this is going to be a strong market. Um, I am of the opinion that we don't need to immediately tear out and throw away our fossil fuel boilers, okay? And I, I'm going to justify that to you. How can we go into a typical, let's say, residential system? Maybe it's a, a cast iron boiler with an oil burner. It's got three zones of baseboard very typical system. Can we bring a heat pump into that system without completely ripping out the existing system? And the answer is yes, and we'll, we'll look at some schematics and some concepts for how to do that. Um, we're also going to look at domestic water heating. You know, obviously, uh, domestic water has been an ancillary load to space heating in, in the typical approach in hydronic heating. We want to keep domestic water as part of our offering, all right? But ventilation is, is another very strong topic uh, coming out of the COVID situations. I'm sure that has a lot of consumer interest, and we're, we're seeing various manufacturers responding to that interest to provide ventilation. So ultimately, working towards a, a, what I call a single source solution, where you go in as an installer, as a contractor, you provide space heating, you provide domestic water heating. You can also provide cooling. This has been the missing part of hydronics for many decades. What do I do about cooling? Okay. Well, with heat pumps coming into the picture, you now have a chill water source, and there is plenty of hardware out there put together in the right way to do small-scale chill water cooling, and then adding ventilation to it. So you're providing a complete HVAC solution as a single contractor. To think about that as, as a business model. Uh, we will take a look at some example systems, various combinations, some heat pumps, some boilers, some combined systems, and then we'll save some time this afternoon at the end for some Q&A. Okay, so let's start off with electrification. 
Uh, I drove up here yesterday and went by a wind farm in upstate New York. There's 195 of these large turbines putting out. Each one of these turbines puts out enough electricity, when the wind is blowing, of course, for about 450 houses. And I'm sure you're, you're seeing wind turbine farms as well as solar farms uh, in New York State right now. Uh, there's uh, literally, there's um, arguments going on in small townships about uh, solar farms. And some of the small towns are starting to recognize, uh, you know, that these solar farms are coming. There's a lot of incentives down there. Uh, I just put down, there's many statistics that justify how electrification is changing the market. And again, folks, I'm not up here to talk about politics. I, you know, we're going to look at what's happening and how do we evolve around what's happening to, to leverage what's happening to our advantage. But in uh, 2020, about 75% of all the new electrical generation in the U.S. was renewable, and typically coming from these large-scale solar farms as well as some of the wind turbine farms. Okay? Now, I know you can't read the details on this, but I, let me explain what this is. This is a publication, if you're interested, and obviously we're in Canada and you may not be as interested in this, but there, there is a group called the Clean Energy State Alliance uh, down in, um, uh, in the states. And they summarize what all the different states are doing as far as their energy planning. And what I did, I just took a couple pages, and if you could see where the yellow highlighting is, I tried to highlight the word electrical or electricity. Pretty much all the states are planning around a very strong push on electrification, okay? And, you know, it's the operative word in this planning, and I suspect it's, it's also the case in Canada as well, is that electrification is being viewed from a political and social standpoint as kind of the saving grace of the energy picture as we go forward. Now, again, set aside the politics, these, these regulations that are going to happen are, you know, they're going to happen. It's a matter of how do we respond to it. Okay. Now, again, I've only listed a few situations here. Uh, moratoriums and phase-outs on fossil fuel. Uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, very um, progressive politically up there. Uh, you can see there, as of January of this year, uh, multi-family buildings, four stories or less, no longer permitted to use natural gas for heating or hot water. New York City passed some legislation. It kicks in next year. It is eventually going to eliminate the use of gas for space heating. And in Canada, I'm sure many of you are aware, there's, and, and again, this is only a sampling, Vancouver, Quebec, Toronto, seeing regulations that are being put in place that are either limiting the use of fossil fuels, in some cases, eliminating them completely over a, a period of time. Um, and again, I, I think in, in, I'm from upstate New York, uh, in downstate New York, Westchester County. Basically, the gas, gas distribution system in Westchester County is at, its, it's at the point where they can't expand it anymore. So development down there is pretty much being forced to look away from natural gas and to other solutions, and typically it's going to be an electrically-based solution. Um, again, you can do some research online. You'll find many uh, towns, and, and a lot of this is aligned with the political uh, standing in these towns, but uh, legislation that is going into place that is going to either limit or eventually eliminate uh, fossil fuels. So this is going to be, sorry we can't give you that, uh, this is going to be a no problem but with a caveat, we think, okay? Uh, the question of whether the grids are ready to handle electrification, not only from a space conditioning standpoint, but with electric vehicles, okay? I think the politics is a little bit ahead of the technology, quite honestly, there, but um, it is moving in that direction. Now, again, uh, what's happening with net zero? Net zero is a hot market for both residential construction and also in commercial. And if you just look at that map there, you'll see, um, actually, uh, this map is meant to show the kind of the intensity of interest or starts, building starts, uh, that are qualified as net zero buildings. And California is way out there in terms of the other states. They're, they're very aggressive in terms of, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the regulation is right now, but let's just say you're either encouraged to 
or you're regulated, mandated to build net zero in California. But behind that, you'll see Ontario is also very active with net zero. And again, there's, there's just a, a wide range of statistics available on how that market is growing, globally growing by about 15% per year. Uh, North America is expected to reach something like 27,000 new housing starts, uh, net zero qualified housing starts by 2025. So there's a strong trend in the residential building market towards net zero. Well, how do you get to net zero? Net zero typically involves photovoltaics, uh, solar panels that are either on site or perhaps a community solar system, but definitely a transition towards a, an electrically based building from an energy standpoint. And of course, heat pumps are going to dovetail into that. So that's another strong market. So we, we've got these factors. We've got strong government push towards electrification, uh, changing policies or regulations, laws regarding fossil fuels, uh, consumer attitudes. I have had calls from uh, people that say, I simply want to eliminate gas from my house. And I, I don't necessarily agree that that's the smartest decision for them to make, but I understand that is their priority. And as a you know, hydronic solution provider, how do you address that? You can address that, okay, even if you may not agree with it politically. Um, net zero construction and obviously the market on heat pumps. Um, we're seeing strong growth, not only in geothermal heat pumps, but also in air to water heat pumps, both of which can supply water that is very suitable for hydronic heating, domestic water heating, and also for chilled water for cooling. So looking at all these factors that are happening, you know, how does it come together? And again, I, I'd encourage you, push the politics aside and simply look at it. This is a big opportunity for the North American market, but it is going to require a bit of rethinking. What do we offer, okay? What do we offer that is a, I, and I use the word solution here strongly. What, what is the consumer looking for? How do we address that, okay? So, that being said, let's go back to this. Poor perceptions of hydronic heating. Now, this is a hydronic heating system circa 1900, okay? And I, look, I always like to look at these old drawings because you knew they weren't drawn with AutoCAD or page, you know, some kind of uh, automation. Somebody sat down with a pencil and, and drew these things. Um, if you look at that, obviously you'll see some radiators. You see the expansion tank up in the attic with the overflow pipe on it. You've, you've got the, probably a coal fire boiler down the basement. If you look down here, you see there were some very specific piping details. What's one component that we see today in all kinds of hydronic applications that's not on that drawing? Anybody see it or not see it? Circulators, okay. Didn't have circulators back then. So how did the water move around? Right, it was buoyancy driven. Hot water rises, cooler water descends. And honestly, I look at something like this and I marvel as an engineer that the engineers of that time recognized what they had to work with, not, you know, not having circulators, and they made these systems work. And they were relatively simple. You build a fire in the boiler, and the hot water would rise, and you know, obviously the control may not have been as good as it is today, but these systems work. So how did we get from that to this? And I just took a sampling, you know, I've got hundreds of photos at home of beautifully done mechanical rooms from a craftsmanship standpoint, but, you know, you look at these, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm going to be hardware agnostic here. It doesn't matter whose product it is. There's a lot of product in all these photos. And some of these photos, other than maybe the one in the middle there, they actually show pretty good craftsmanship. Would, would you agree with that? The pipes are plumb, level, sometimes, uh, you know, the controls are, are reasonably arranged on this. So it looks good from a craftsmanship standpoint, but is this where hydronics is going in the future? And um, it's not, in my opinion. Not if we're going to adapt to a market 
that, uh, especially a market that is looking for simple, repeatable, reliable solutions. There will remain a market for the high-end systems, okay? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll call it the vanity mechanical room, for lack of a better term. And we've seen some incredibly well-done systems in terms of, uh, I just saw a system recently where the entire mechanical room was lined with copper sheeting, like wallpaper. It was copper sheeting and with very nice lighting. And it, it, was, it was beautiful, but again, think about it from the average Joe standpoint. What does the average Joe see when they look at that? They, they think hydronics is beyond the reach financially, and it, it probably those types of systems, that's, that's true. So if we want the hydronics market to expand, we've got to look for solutions for the average Joe and also tailor those solutions around where our energy markets are, where our building markets are today. So, you know, I, I picked this out. This is a, uh, a power plant from, I think, in the 1960s, all right? Is this what it takes to operate a hydronic system? And again, look at that. And, and you installers that are out there in the audience, if you take a look at the, the control system over there, and th those are good controls, no, no problem with the, the quality of the product, but uh, just imagine you're walking into that mechanical room, it's midnight, and the owner doesn't have heat. And you see some little lights flashing or whatever. Where do you start to diagnose that system? Okay. Is there documentation for that system? Is there a description of operation that would help you determine what is the system supposed to do when it's working correctly, much less what's wrong with it? So again, that system, I'm familiar with that system, and it works. But there's a lot of control complexity in that system. And again, the average Joe tends to look at something like that as not only expensive, but they look at it, boy, what happens when it breaks? So I'm, I'm very big on reliability. And to use a term that's being thrown around a lot now in the media, resiliency. Do you folks hear that word up here a lot? Resilient design. Remember the uh, a couple winters ago down in Texas, there was that polar vortex that hit down around Dallas, Fort Worth. And it literally, it wiped out power, water, sewer, gas. It just stopped everything. And it was the ex, uh, absolute opposite of resiliency. So resilient design is being discussed a lot today in, in contemporary media. And consumers are starting to look for, well, how does my system get through a power outage for three days? Okay. If I can't get a very specific component, if it fails, for six months, and my, is my system down? We have to start thinking about you know, the reality of supply chain issues as, as well as um, keeping these systems as reliable as possible. So again, uh, over, over the top controls, there, there may remain a small niche in the market for these, but again, the, the, for the market to grow, my feeling is we, we need to build simple, repeatable, reliable systems. Okay, and you know, this is an example. I don't want you to study that schematic too much now. I'm gonna come back to several schematics like this and kind of walk you through what they do later on today in, in the second part, okay? Now, adapting hydronics to uh, evolving building requirements. What's happening with residential buildings? Well, certainly energy codes and, as well as energy prices are forcing energy usage factors down. If we go back into pre-1990, it was common, and hopefully some of you folks that have been doing this for a while can back me up on this. It was common to see design heating loads in houses in the range of about 25 to maybe 40 BTUs per hour per square foot. Okay, sound reasonable? All right, back in, you know, again, pre-2000. Pre Today, it's not uncommon to find some of the buildings, especially buildings that are being built towards a net zero status that will have design loads in the range of about 10 to 15 BTUs per hour per square foot. Remember, design conditions, coldest day of the year conditions. So we're at roughly a third of what our design loads were maybe two to three decades ago. That's, that's a major change, and it should affect how we tailor our hydronic systems. Uh, we've talked about the strong interest in net zero, a strong consumer interest in that. And you know, getting there with typically photovoltaic systems combined with heat pumps. 
Strong consumer interest, these terms, sustainability, resiliency, recycling materials. Uh, and one of the, the factors, one of the uh, attributes of, of well-designed and well-installed hydronic systems that I don't think we stress enough is we can design systems, distribution systems. Let's, let's put the heat source aside for a moment. Our distribution systems will last for decades. Is that a fair statement? What do you think? If you do a good job installing a hydronic distribution system, it's going to last for decades, sometimes for the life of the building. What other appliance can you name in a house that's going to last 30 years? Refrigerator? I'm just replacing one at six years old. It's failed, okay? Dishwasher? You, you know where I'm going with this? We, we should stress that well-designed, well-installed hydronic systems are a long-term investment. And they have value as such. Value beyond what many consumers come to expect today with appliances that oftentimes don't even last 10 years. And many of those systems have materials that are recyclable. Steel, cast iron is highly recyclable. So we have some attributes there that we, we should talk about. And I mentioned this earlier, the, the Achilles heel in terms of convincing consumers to go with hydronics oftentimes has been, what do I do about cooling? Okay, well, here's a business card from my buddy. He does cooling systems, you know, go talk to him. That creates problems. Yes, there are projects where that happens, but let's say the, the, the heating contractor and the cooling contractor meet at the thermostat and there's a problem. Whose problem is it <laughs> at that point? You see, the, the problem of having multiple contractors into a single system uh, it goes away if we can provide a total solution. And now with, with heat pumps, again, either geothermal or air to water, we have the ability to provide that chill water. If you can generate chill water, you can do small-scale hydronic cooling. Um, <clears throat> now, this is an interesting one. Large surface area radiant panels operating at low surface temperature, 71 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit in low energy homes. When you have a house that only loses 10 BTUs per hour per square foot, the floors are not going to get very warm. They will satisfy the thermostat. Let's say we set our thermostat for 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But the floor might only be four or five degrees above that temperature. It's not going to give you what I call that barefoot friendly floor that is often advertised. And again, it's not that the system isn't heating the building. It is satisfying the thermostat. But be, be cautious about this because consumers oftentimes think if I spend the money to go with floor heating, I'm going to have that toasty warm floor. If you try to do that in a low energy use building, you're simply going to overheat the building. The floor doesn't have to get very warm because you know, you've got a large surface area and you've got a relatively low load. Uh, I've done a calculation, I'll show it to you this afternoon, where even on a design day, the floor only gets to about 73 or 74 degrees to maintain the air temperature at about 70 degrees. So make sure that a consumer, potential uh, uh, client of yours, understands that if they're building a low energy building and they want to use floor heating, that the floors will heat the building. They're just not going to be as warm as you might expect. You, you don't want that expectation to be unfulfilled. Okay. Um, internal heat gains can be very significant in low energy buildings. If we have sun coming in a window, uh, that room can heat up very quickly because the loss is very minimal. How do we adapt a hydronic system to that? One of, one of my favorite solutions is panel radiators with thermostatic valves on them. They can continuously adjust what's happening with the heat output at the radiator as conditions in the room change, either internal gains from sunlight or people or equipment that's operating. And of course, there are other solutions. You can do it with thermostats as well. But understand that when you have a low energy use building, internal gains have much uh, stronger influence as to how quickly that space might overheat. Okay, So a high mass system is not necessarily the best option when you have these internal gains present. Um, obviously, increasing interest in good in interior air or environmental quality. Uh, 
COVID has certainly pushed that along. And discriminating interest in achieving superior comfort. Uh, we continue to find consumers that are dissatisfied with the comfort in their house. Uh, and, you know, hydronics has that ability when it's done properly to provide that superior comfort. So we, we can never forget about the comfort side of our marketing. Uh, I'm an engineer. You know, when I got into hydronics, I got very excited about things like cross-link polyethylene pipe, outdoor reset control, variable speed injection mixing, right? I love the technology of it. And I used to try to explain that to consumers. And, you know, I'm seeing a consumer like, we, we don't care. Just make us comfortable. And I learned the lesson that comfort is really the, the key thing to selling hydronic systems. So as we move into alternate heat sources and maybe different means of constructing our hydronic systems, we can never get away, or we should never get away from superior comfort. Okay? So let's go into that section. It's about comfort, not just matching B2 delivery to load. Okay, now the net zero market, um, I've watched this for several years in the US, and one of the conclusions I've come to is that the ductless mini split heat pumps seem to be the default recommendation coming from people that are training architects, training builders in uh, net zero housing construction. Just put in a, a mini split and you don't have to worry about all those complications and hydronics. And I showed you previously some of those slides with controls and pumps all over the place and so forth. Again, that's sending a message of complication and expense and potential unreliability. So people that are, again, training architects, training builders, they really push the ductless mini splits. And a common suggestion, you know, put in maybe one or two of these wall cassettes and leave the interior doors open for heat distribution. And I actually took this right off a website, <coughs> excuse me, called the Green Building Advisor. And uh, let me just read a couple of these. Leave bedroom doors open during the day if you want to heat your house with a ductless mini split located in a living room or hallway. You'll need to leave your bedroom doors open during the day. When the bedroom doors are closed at night, bedroom temperatures may drop five degrees. Is that a compromise in comfort potential? I think it is, okay? You're, you're counting on the air moving through the interior doors as, as a means of balancing heat in the, the building. If the family doesn't want to abide by this or doesn't want to accept occasional low bedroom temperatures during winter, then supplemental electric resistance heaters should be installed. Is that a compromise? Yeah, it's a compromise, okay? It's not that it, it can't work, but it is a compromise. And the other thing I've noticed, and I've, again, I've, I've tried to watch this, Oftentimes, the ductless mini-split market, they will talk about how they retain heating capacity at sub-zero degree Fahrenheit temperatures with compressor speed increases and so forth. And yes, it's true. They can maintain that capacity. Ask what happens to the COP of a ductless mini-split at minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hard to find that data. It exists, but this is not something that is well promoted. The COPs drop off considerably. And you know, if you've never heard COP, it's basically the efficiency of the heat pump. It's output divided by input. So the COPs do drop off significantly, even though capacity can be retained uh, pretty much steady down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit. It does drop off a little bit after that. And I had to put this in here, nine ways to hide a mini split. This was in a, uh, a building website down in the States called Pro Trade Craft. And uh, somebody wrote this article nine ways to hide a mini split. And if you take a look at that uh, in the upper right there, this one, you can see what they've done. They've actually built this wooden grill. Does that move around? Yeah. They built this wooden grill over the ductless mini split. Well, it does sort of hide it. What do you think that does to the performance or the airflow? You think that's all been engineered out? <laughs> okay. Uh, just leave half the area open. You'll be okay. And, you know, this one looks kind of interesting. They built this little... Uh, recess cavity here to drop the mini split into. And again, I would question uh, stratification of air temperature there. I'd also question airflow. Is, is there enough space around that? Is the relationship between that little uh, recess cavity and the airflow pattern generated out of the, uh, the cassette head, has that been looked at? 
So, you know, the architects don't really want to look at these things. Uh, and most consumers don't look at, don't like to look at them, but some consumers accept them. So, you know, I think we can do better, to be honest with you, with hydronics. I know we can do better in terms of comfort. So indoor environmental quality, uh, my, my friend Robert Bean, who's, you know, often talks a lot about this, all the different factors that go into determining whether humans are comfortable in their space. And, you know, it's not just about air temperature. And yet oftentimes air temperature becomes what I call the sole proxy for determining whether we have comfort, okay? But surface temperatures, temperature stratification, is it cool at the floor, warm up at the ceiling, humidity, you know, if there's a lot of air leakage in the building, your relative humidity is going to be low, you're going to have the static shocks and the bleeding, nosebleeds and so forth. Air movement, drafts, high velocity air movement, uh, not comfortable, cleanliness, uh, microbes and so forth, and, and noise, okay? Most people don't want to listen to HVAC systems. So it, again, we can offer solutions that are very, very quiet, okay? So what's important? Again, many people don't understand that there's a lot of factors involved in, in determining true comfort. They simply look at, you know, if the thermostat says 70 degrees, then I must be comfortable, all right? And oftentimes people don't understand what is possible. They simply tolerate what they've been given. And again, I've, I've looked at some of these projects uh, with um, high wall cassettes mounted you know, 14 feet up in the air, blowing air into a space that's 20 feet tall, questioning, you know, how is it stratified? You know, are there drafts? Are the people truly comfortable? Are the floors comfortable? And in general, it's not as good as what we can offer. So I put down, it's not just about delivering BTUs, it's about comfort. And I have this idea or concept, I call it BTUs in a box. And if you've ever studied the basics of thermodynamics says, if you have a space, a container, okay, and energy is leaving that container at some rate, if you can put energy back into the container at the same rate that it's leaving, then the temperature inside the container stays constant. That's just called energy balance, okay? And it's a really simple concept, but that doesn't guarantee that you're going to have comfort in that space, okay? Thermodynamics is satisfied by the fact that if I'm losing 10,000 BTUs per hour and I'm putting 10,000 BTUs per hour back in, thermodynamics is satisfied. The science, so to speak, is satisfied. But there could be stratification, cold floors, cold surfaces, people are just, it doesn't guarantee comfort. So again, BTUs delivered, except during defrost. Anybody uh, been in a space in the wintertime when a ductless mini split goes into defrost? What does it do when it goes into defrost? Anybody? It blows cold air into space. It's, it goes into cooling mode, basically. It's got to melt the frost on the outside. Some units do shut off the fan, but ultimately it's got to take heat from the space and put it outside to melt the frost on that unit. So um, I've had some experience. My daughter actually had a house that had these in it. She called me up on a February night. It was cold. She said, how come the, the heat pump is in cooling? I said, well, it's, it's defrosting. Let it run its cycle. It'll eventually change back to heating. And she was definitely compromised in that. What we offer is true comfort, uh, combinations of convective and radiant heat delivery and doing it in a way that is conducive to all those factors affecting thermal comfort. So why hydronics? Okay, I always like to start off with comparing water to air. We've been given these materials to work with. You know, we, can't, we didn't create water, we didn't create air, but we, we have the ability to manipulate these materials. And when we use air, we use devices like a blower and what I call the third greatest invention of mankind here, right? Duck, uh, flex ducting, right? Comes right after WD-40 and duct tape in terms of the importance to uh, mankind. And you look at that photograph of those ducks and uh, some of you can probably see there's some really long zip ties holding those ducks up, okay? And I always like to ask this question when I look at something like this. What's it gonna look like in 10 years? What's it going to look like in 10 years? Will those ducks settle on those um, zip ties? 
How many have seen flex duct wrapped around roof trusses? Anybody? How many have seen flex duct wrapped around roof trusses where somebody has walked on the flex duct to get from one end to the other of the attic? Okay. So, yes, it's there. It can be used successfully. It's not a universal replacement for metal duct. Um, but when we switch to water, we can go to much lower power consuming devices and we can go to distribution systems that use much smaller, much easier to integrate conduits. We, we happen to call them tubes or pipes, but that's half inch, um, that's PEX aluminum PEX. And you can see, if I showed that photo to a consumer and I asked them, what is that black material that you see there? They'd say, oh, it's probably wire. Because they're used to seeing wire running along floor joists, going through holes in the joists and so forth. But with small diameter, typically half inch, in some cases even 3 8 inch tubing, we can distribute that heat through the building with minimally invasive effects on the structure of the building. Okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, let's go to the science. If you go to that far column, I won't bore you with a lot of science here, but BTUs per cubic foot per degree Fahrenheit. It's called heat capacity, okay? A cubic foot of water takes 62.4 BTUs to raise it one degree Fahrenheit. A cubic foot of air, if I move uh, the cursor right down here, it only takes 18 thousandths of one BTU to raise a cubic foot of air one degree Fahrenheit, all right? And what does that mean? It means the ability of the material to simply hold heat. So if you take the ratio of those two heat capacities, water at the top at 62.4, air at the bottom at 0 0.018, water is almost 3,500 times better at absorbing heat compared to air. Fundamentally, folks, that is why hydronic heating and cooling exists, okay? There's a tremendous difference between the ability of water and the ability of air to absorb heat. That's why we can go to much smaller conduits Okay, and here's a, here's a quick example. A three-quarter inch tube operating at a typical, let's say it's a design load condition, so let's just say we're at a 20 degree delta T, 20 degree Fahrenheit delta T. The energy that a three-quarter inch tube could carry would be equivalent to using air with a 14 inch wide, eight inch tall duct. And I purposely made that drawing and I showed what I call sawzall surgery. Has anybody ever seen that up here in Canada, sawzall surgery, where somebody takes a sawzall and says, I'll, I'll get that duct through those joists, or I'll get that, you know, four-inch DWV pipe through those joists. Obviously, that would destroy the structure or greatly impair the structure. So the idea of minimally invasive installation is, is definitely an advantage that we have when we work with water. And that tube, that three-quarter-inch tube, it could, it could be a copper tube, it could be a PEX tube. It doesn't really matter what the material is. Uh, and we can do that because of water's vastly superior heat capacity. Here's another example. I just picked 12,000 BTUs per hour because it, it corresponds to a ton, right? If you're dealing with air conditioning, 12,000 BTUs per hour is a ton of heating capacity. And some of these houses that we're talking about, design load might be two tons. That'd be 24,000 BTUs per hour. I can move a 12,000 BTU per hour rate of heat transfer through a half inch tube, half inch PEX tube with a 20 degree delta T, and you'll see some photos down below there of running PEX tubing either along floor joists or maybe through some holes in the joists. But if I choose to do that same 12,000 BTUs per hour with air, as an example, I need a nine inch round duct or a seven inch by 10 inch rectangular duct with four, both operating at a 45 degree difference between supply air and return air to get the equivalent rate of heat transfer. And the question simply is, where can I put a nine inch round duct or a seven by 10 rectangular duct compared to where I can put that half inch PEX tube? If that's a typical floor joist, maybe a two by 10 or two by 12, if I go through the center, I have virtually no effect on the structure of that, the, the strength of that joist. I could drill maybe a three-quarter inch hole, run that half inch tube through there, very easy. Uh, with the ducting, I can't do that, or I shouldn't do that. I'm gonna hang the ducting from the bottom. So, you know, some photos over on the right just showing, uh, you know, what I'd consider compromise of the space where 
you build a soffit around a duct or you run multiple ducts through an attic space, it's a lot harder to put ducting in a building than it is small diameter tubing. Now, again, I'm going to look at consumers today, uh, uh, many of them are interested in renewable energy. If you, if you just did a survey, do you think we should have more renewable energy in our energy mix? Most consumers will probably say yes. What degree they would probably vary on, but most of them are positive on renewable energy. So how does hydronics and how does it intersect with renewable energy? Or oh, I use the word enhance here. Uh, obviously, it's easy if you're using hydronics to bring many different types of renewable heat sources into the picture. It could be solar collectors, it could be heat pumps, it could be biomass boilers. We've got some exhibitors here showing pellet boilers, wood gasification boilers. So it's adaptable to a wide range of heat sources. Uh, low, uh, low temperature operation, we have many options to build temperatures, or, I'm sorry, build systems that can operate at bathtub water temperatures even on a design day, so we can get high efficiency from sources like heat pumps. High distribution efficiency. Let me just see, show, how many here have heard the, the term distribution efficiency? Anybody out there? A little hard for me to see. It's, it's, a, it's something that you should talk about with consumers. It's easy to understand. Distribution efficiency is simply the rate that you're moving heat through a building. Take a design day. Let's say we're moving 25,000 BTUs per hour from some kind of a heat source through some kind of a distribution system and divide it by the wattage, the wattage of the electrical equipment necessary to move that heat. It's not the wattage to generate the heat. It's not about running the heat pump or whatever it is. It's about simply moving the heat from where it's produced to where it needs to go in the building. And with a hydronic system, oftentimes, and I'll show you some examples, we can do that at less than 10% of the wattage of a forest air system, even with ECM blowers, okay? We have a very strong advantage in terms of the energy use that it takes to move energy through a building versus the forest air side. And to me, that should count. If, if we're truly trying to reduce energy usage, it shouldn't be just about the heat source. It should also be the distribution system uh, energy requirement or usage. So hydronics is, is vastly superior to air in terms of distribution efficiency. Storage, I, I just said how good water is at storing heat. Some systems are going to involve storage. It might be when you're using an off-peak electrical rate. It might be uh, eventually a utility setup where loads are shed and you're using thermal storage to carry through that period. It could be in combination with something like a, a pellet boiler or wood gasification boiler that to operate those at high efficiency and low emissions, you really need to burn it hot and fast and put that energy into thermal storage. Hydronics is very adaptable to thermal storage. Um, no building filled with refrigerant tubing. Taking a little shot here at the VRF systems. I've seen them. We've been in buildings with them. Uh, thousands of feet of copper tubing, hundreds of pounds of refrigerant. They work. Uh, I think there's potential there for a hazmat situation. Um, I actually had an opportunity, I, and I didn't do this, I had an opportunity to sabotage one of those systems once. I actually was in a hotel where there was a VRF system being installed on a particular floor, and I was having dinner there with a fellow that I knew, and he said, well, let's go up and look at that VRF system. So we just hopped in the elevator, went up to the fourth floor. First of all, the elevator shouldn't have stopped at the fourth floor. It should have been locked out because that's where the contractors were working. And they had the VRF system all up, and a guy had left his gauge set connected. All I had to do was open a valve, and I could have dumped refrigerant into the building. But, um, you know, obviously I, I didn't do that. Um, now... Easy integration with existing heat sources. We're going to talk more and more about this as we get into it this afternoon. I'm of the opinion that if you have a boiler in a system and it has life left to it, five years, ten years maybe, I'm of the opinion, don't tear that boiler out. If you're going to put a heat pump in, and we'll talk about that. The, the boiler brings a lot of literally resilient resiliency into the design. We can run that boiler as supplemental heat. We can run it as backup heat if the, the heat pump is down. And 
in a power outage situation, we can run a residential boiler on a tiny little generator, a little you know, portable Honda type generator. We can't do that with a heat pump that might need four or five kW. We, we could do it with a much larger generator. So there is rational thought to leaving that heat source in there, displacing the majority of the energy, and I'll give you some stats on that this afternoon, where we're moving upwards of 80, 85 percent of that heat from fossil fuel to an electrically operated heat pump, but we're still going to need that backup heat on those, you know, really cold nights, or if the heat pump is down and waiting for service. So this combination of an existing boiler with a new heat pump retrofit into the system, there's, there's a lot of very good sellable points about that. Um, obviously, zoning is easy to do in a variety of ways with hydronics, and then heat metering. Uh, looking at district systems. We're, we're seeing a lot of interest in New York State right now in what's called district geothermal systems, where uh, they're looking at doing underground piping in an entire you know, city, basically, and then tying multiple heat pumps into it. So it's not that building A has a separate ground loop to it, building B has its own ground loop, and so forth. It's a, in a sense, a geothermal utility concept. And, you know, to do that, we need to meter energy. And there are several companies that have uh, thermal meters, BTU meters that are out there. Basically, they measure flow rate, they measure delta T, and there's a simple calculation to transition those numbers into um, energy. Uh, real quick, and I'm, I'm looking at my watch here. We're going to try to wrap up here in no more than about 10 minutes. Um, Distribution efficiency, I already mentioned what it is. Rate of heat delivery divided by rate of energy used by the equipment. So real quick example. Here's a system, 12, or I'm sorry, 120,000 BTUs being delivered using four 85-watt circulators, okay? So here's what the, the numbers look like. If we just take 120,000 BTUs per hour divided by four times 85, four circulators at 85 watts apiece, we get this number. 353 BTUs per hour per watt. And by itself, that number doesn't mean anything. Well, all you can infer from that is this particular system, for each watt of electrical power we supply our distribution system, it delivers 353 BTUs per hour from where it was produced to where it's needed in the building. Okay? So why is it important? Again, hydronic systems should minimize fuel use as well as electrical energy. Now, let's compare it to something. I, I took an older furnace that delivers 80,000 BTUs per hour on 850 watts. Why 850 watts? It's a blower. It needs a lot more power to move that inefficient fluid we happen to call air compared to water. So here's what the number looks like, 94 BTUs per hour per watt. So just in these two systems, it's roughly a four to one ratio. The hydronic system is moving an, an amount of heat using roughly a quarter of the electrical energy, okay? And it can get a lot better than that. Here's a really simple idea. I'm showing a buffer tank. doesn't matter what the heat source is. could be a heat pump, could be a boiler, could be off-peak electric. Uh, but we've got a tank with warm water, and we simply got a, a small variable speed pump connecting to a manifold station and half-inch PEX tubing going out to panel radiators. And I actually made this system up. It's, um, it's a hypothetical system. But I used data to calculate we could move 30,800 BTUs per hour from that buffer tank to the radiators. And in theory, even with a relatively inefficient circulator, I think I used 20% wire-to-water efficiency on the circulator, it only requires a little under 9 watts of pumping power. Okay. That's an incredibly small amount of power, you know, and, and here's concepts, just there's panel radiators available, you can look at them here, there's circulators available. So the hardware to put this kind of a system together is readily available, and look at the distribution efficiency. It's almost 3,600. Now, compared to that forest air furnace, we're using less than 3% of the electrical energy for a given rate of heat transport, you know, relative to the forest air system. Okay, and I uh, got a few minutes. Air to water heat pumps. How many here are familiar with air to water heat pumps? Anybody? Anybody installing them up here? 
Folks, start thinking about it, okay? Now, I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with these, right? Ductless mini splits, air to air. Air is the source, air is the means of delivery. And I'm sure most of you have seen water to water heat pumps, typically in geothermal applications, geothermal loop or well field, and then hydronic distribution. So what we're doing with an air to water heat pump, we're simply using the air side of an air to air heat pump. We're using air as our source of low grade heat and we're going to water as our distribution fluid. So we're going from air to a hydronic system. There's a lot of them on the market and more coming, okay? More coming every year. Um, these are what are called monoblock heat pumps. I, I sometimes refer to them as self-contained, factory charged. Literally, you're gonna connect the water piping and you're gonna connect the electrical. The refrigerant is, is already in the system. In a, in a Canadian climate as well as in North America, typically you're gonna use antifreeze because using water outside is risky. In, you know, in theory, in theory, if the power is always on and the machine is always working, you wouldn't have to worry about that, but in reality, power outages and so forth, typically it's gonna be either a, a, a solution, say 25 to 40% solution of propylene glycol antifreeze, and then the whole system would have that same fluid in it. Or you can use a heat exchanger down at the bottom. I've looked at both of these, and I, I will tell you, my preference at this point is the top, to use antifreeze through the whole system. It does get more complicated with a heat exchanger. That heat exchanger has to be very generously sized. You need two circulators. You're creating a closed pressurized loop between the heat exchanger and the heat pump, so you need trim, expansion tank, relief valve, purging valves, air separator, and so forth. Both can work, but the upper one is, is a bit simpler, and the fact that you've got antifreeze in the whole system does give you some brownie points for that word resiliency, okay, in a power outage. The other configuration is a split system, refrigerant tubing between the inside and the outside units. Now you don't have to worry about antifreeze in the, in the system. You could still use it if you wanted to, but it's only a refrigerant to the outdoor unit, so it's not going to freeze. This does, obviously, this requires refrigerant skills to put in. You need to connect the line set properly, evacuate it, pressure test it, uh, and then um, uh, get the proper charge of refrigerant in that system. Real quick, uh, and there is a PDF file, by the way, all these slides. Over on the left, these, these are the players right now, to the best of my knowledge, okay? And you'll see you've got several companies up here in Canada that are manufacturing or selling products, the ones that are in red there. And then over on the right, just in terms of, you know, discussions in, in, with different people, what's coming? It might be this year, it might be next year, but there's a lot of companies that are looking at this because they see where these energy markets are headed and they don't want to put all their eggs in the fossil fuel basket. They're going to uh, diversify in, in terms of what they offer. Real quickly, performance on an air to water heat pump, like any heat pump, is dependent upon two things. It's dependent upon the temperature of the material that you're sourcing the heat from. In this case, it's outside air. So you see these curves, uh, the capacity goes up very, very quickly as the air temperature outside goes up and, and vice versa. Uh, it is also dependent on the temperature of the water the heat pump is producing. And the lower the water temperature, the better. So the number I'd like to toss out there as a practical limit is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If you design your hydronic system so that on a design day, your water temperature requirement doesn't have to be above 120 degrees, you're going to have compatibility and reasonably good annual performance with an air-to-water heat pump, as well as if you're using ModCon boilers or geothermal heat pumps, that's another good number. So I, I suggest 120 degrees Fahrenheit as kind of an upper limit for where we as an industry should design our systems. And I, I use the term future-proofing. We want to design a system. Remember, these systems are going to last for decades. They are going to outlive their first heat source and probably their second heat source. 25, 30 years into the future, I don't know what that new heat source is going to be, but my bet is it's going to operate better at low water temperatures. It's going to operate more efficiently at low temperatures. So what we do today has long-term ramifications in terms of do we, do, do we need to do a, a very extensive retrofit of a high temperature hydronic system that we can still legally install today? 
or do we design with anticipation for where those future heat sources are going to operate well? So both the heating capacity and the COP of these heat pumps is very dependent on water temperature. Low water temperatures are better, okay? Um, outdoor reset control, I'm sure many of you use it now, uh, but outdoor reset control does benefit systems with heat pumps because now what we're doing is we're reducing the water temperature under part load conditions. So the heat pump is going to operate at um, higher efficiency. And it's easy to do it. Many of the latest generation air to water heat pumps, as well as some of the latest generation water to water heat pumps, they have outdoor reset control built in. Okay? So they will automatically change the temperature of the water going out of the heat pump depending on what the outside temperature is. And again, the objective there is to increase the efficiency. I will show you again more complete systems this afternoon on this. So, uh, wow, I actually finished with only two minute override. How's that? That's, that's unusual for me. Um, what are we gonna talk about this afternoon? the importance of those low temperature systems, retrofitting air to water heat pumps into existing systems, domestic water heating and ventilation, how do we put all that together? And we'll finish up with example systems and uh, Q&A. So with that, thank you for coming this morning. Please come back at four o'clock. <laughs>